Thank you so much, Henrik. Yeah, indeed, this doesn't look like all that of a technical problem anymore. Henrik's slide here looks much more like a social network of interacting actors, and it indeed is. And it is indeed one way in which we approach risk management today. One way that we approach it is through mapping these very social networks. We have researchers, for instance, mapping the social networks involved in uh, urban water resource risk management in Sweden and abroad, and they map those to look for the critical nodes, the critical actors, for functional and structural gaps that will need to be bridged in order to manage risk more efficiently. So as risk management indeed has become more and more of a social problem, we as researchers have followed. And my name is Johan Bergström. I'm a colleague of Henrik at our division of risk management and societal safety. And I will introduce you to what I see as three trends, looking at both research and policy, as we have had introduced here also in, in the beginning of this session, on societal risk management. The three trends are that safety and security is becoming more and more one and the same thing, the all hazards approach, if you like. The second trend that I will introduce is that resilience is the notion then introduced as a solution to this problem. And the third trend is that risk management is not even all that much management as it is governance nowadays. But I will get back to that, of course. Let's start with the first trend, that safety and security have come and are becoming more and more treated as one and the same thing in public policy, discourse, and indeed also research. The big game changer here was 9-11, the terror attacks to the US back in 2001. It changed the rules of the game. Some four years later, the Hurricane Katrina struck the same country, the US, and the same thing there. What events like these reminded humanity was that not only threats, but also their magnitudes are inherently unpredictable. And it is pretty hard to mitigate, control, or manage what you cannot even predict in the first place. So this recognition led to new agencies formed, as we have heard also earlier, with responsibility for both safety and security. So in the US, the Department for Homeland Security. In Sweden, the Civil Contingencies Agency, MSB, was formed with both safety and security threats in their management portfolio, their all-hazard approach again. And this is a growing portfolio. Because if the threat is inherently unpredictable, pretty much anything could be a safety and security problem. And this is a process, this process of turning more and more social activities into risk management activities, that is a process that research calls securitization. A process by which aspects of societal life becomes aspects of risk management policy. So just to give you a very simple example, uh, the argument that also Swedish home care delivery services should have access to the radio communication system called Rakel that binds together all actors in the Swedish crisis management system, that argument is the argument that also the activity of home care in Sweden should be part of a risk management network and discourse. And so the safety field and risk management field has grown through this process of securitization. And agencies like MSB, for instance, have responded to this by saying, hey, this is getting too big. We cannot manage this anymore from a centralized perspective. We need to start decentralizing responsibility for risk management down to more local actors. And this decentralization of responsibility is one that's been advocated through the notion that we've also heard mentioned several times already, the notion of resilience. Because recognizing that we, that we as humanity in this geological age that we call the Anthropocene, that we 
are responsible for both the safety and security threats that we face can be pretty discouraging. But in the notion of resilience, we've found the optimistic belief that we can do something about it. Resilience is what represents our belief in our ability to continuously adapt to this inherently unpredictable environment that we face. And just to give you a brief history of the term, resilience doesn't make any sense in Scandinavian languages. In Anglo-Saxon languages, it makes a lot of different senses to different schools of thought. In material physics and engineering, resilience has since the 19th century been treated as the ability of a material to regain its shape after being put to stress, for instance. The resilience of a spring is the ability of a spring to regain its former shape after being put to stress. Now, in psychology and health research, a completely different story. In psychology and health research, where resilience have been, have been the focus of attention since the Second World War, basically, Resilience represents the ability of a human to thrive despite adversity. And typical study objects have been war-traumatized children or veterans. And their resilience has been used as sort of a counter-theory to post-traumatic stress. They talk about post-traumatic growth instead as resilience theory. Then if we go to ecology and ecosystem sciences, resilience has since the 1970s been the ability to continuously adapt to constantly evolving and changing stressors. And here you see the connection to public risk management discourse, that this is how it's implemented in policies worldwide, but mainly in the Anglo-Saxon world, back to 9-11 and Katrina being very much the wake-up calls. It's resilience policy to emphasize that crisis preparedness, that preparedness to the unpredictable crisis takes place in local communities and networks. Like the social network on Henrik's slide, if you like. And this is how it's also been and is continuously implemented. Sara mentioned the upcoming crisis preparedness week. Here is an example from Australia. The, they always put them in flowers in Australia, I don't know why. This is the, the pamphlet for the Get Ready Queensland campaign, one of the campaign folders for Get Ready Queensland. Similar campaign run every year prior to bushfire season in Queensland in Eastern Australia. And here I, as a citizen, can get the first four-step guide. The first one, prepare your emergency plan, and I get information for how I do that. Second one, prepare my emergency kit with information to how I do that. Prepare my home, tune into warnings, and then some scenario-based guidelines. Resilience as this decentralized responsibility of me as a citizen to get ready for the unpredictable crisis. And I was talking to the campaign director of this specific campaign in an interview, and he said, yeah, but this is important in order to combat a culture of learned helplessness. A culture of learned helplessness, he referred to. And there is a sociological critique of introducing resilience in this way. There is the sociological critique that resilience discourse in this way represents a sort of neoliberal drive to push responsibility down to the most of local of actors in society for state agencies and bodies to, to step back from their responsibility. There is also the critique that this resilience discourse represents little more than an Anglo-Saxon colonialization of risk management ideals. And there might be something in that critique as well to, to consider. But I think this is a clear example of how risk management is not so much even a problem of management anymore as it's a problem of even political governance. And that's my third trend of, of this talk, that governing risk, dictating the rules of this risk game, influencing these social networks, are all acts of governance and power. And when power is exercised, there will be resistance. When power is exercised, there will be winners and there will be losers. So who are those? 
Well, it's actually one of our research questions. We have, for instance, an excellent PhD student going to Nepal to study the adaptive strategies used by Sherpa communities there. And we send students to various places around the world that we would perceive as high risk and ask for their local perceptions of the people living there. And we see over and over again in our data that we cannot discuss risk exposure in terms of rational choices or even in terms of irrational delusion or biased belief. We can only understand risk exposure in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of inequality, and in terms of power. Because in this securitized world that we are in, we see more and more states advocating the need, and the US is leading the way here, in advocating the need for a culture of preparedness. Essentially what they are doing is that they are dictating what normative values that we are supposed to embody and share. And with state institutions and governments dictating what normative values that we are supposed to embody and how they should guide our actions, I think perhaps there is the, need, there is the risk that we forget a much more important discussion of whether we and others do have the necessary resources to adapt in the first place. Because we cannot ask people to start adapting without having the necessary resources and capacities to do so in the first place. And I think if there is something that we as a scientific community can do, that is to speak up for those with limited resources to adapt in the first place. Because if we start blaming future disaster impact on lacking adaptive capacities on part of those who might not have had anything to do with the development of the threats in the first place, and that's not just unfair, that would be an abuse of the power to define the rules for the game of risk governance. I leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you.